So we produce one video a week. Uh, so every Friday pretty much. And so we did one on building the Kibler Wood Runner and uh, I'm overwhelmed with the number of people that have responded. But the reason I'm doing, I'm gonna call this an addendum, I guess, to that video is, had a lot of questions about how I finished it. But the, the biggest and most frequent one was, well, that, that dude's got his sights on backwards. Well, yeah, I did. And it, and it wasn't a trick to see, but I must say I'm pretty impressed with the, how many people actually picked up on it. <clears throat> so as you can see, um, they are back on the proper way. Now, <laughs> the reason I did it is I, I'm a 70-year-old fellow, and I've got 70-year-old eyes. And I used to be fairly competitive even with handguns in my youth, but now you get, you get to the point, and I caution you, as you age, this is going to happen to most of you. It's, for example, with, a, with even a long gun, but with a handgun, I can see the target, I can, or I can see the front sight, or I can see the back, but I can't focus on all three anymore. So it was an experiment to see if the relief angle that's on, on a rear sight, if I face that towards me, and I turn the ramp of the front sight the other way, it might allow me to quicker focus on those two points. And when I did it, um, I wanted to see how the gun grouped and I'm pretty impressed. I mean, the barrel's not even broken in and I'm, I was getting um, less than two inch groups, uh, but it made no difference. So, <laughs> uh, and so I don't have to answer another 40 or 50 inquiries. Is why are the sights backwards? They're right now and it shoots the same. So it, did, it made no difference, but I thought it a fun experiment. Uh, it did shoot low, really low. In fact, I've probably filed about half of the front sight down, which brings the barrel up. And uh, yeah, I've got the elevation right now. I've got the windage right. And now it's just a matter of working up loads. But the other question was, um, what did I use to patina it with or finish it with? So there are as many ways to do this as there are minutes in a day. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people have different opinions. Personally, the best way to patina uh, a flintlock musket is to use it. Uh, I have tried different things on barrels, though, to try to speed up that process. So, uh, One of the methods I've used is uh, uh, Dijon mustard, uh, which has vinegar in it, which is a mild acid, pure vinegar. I even heard some guy actually use bleach. Not a good idea. Uh, so what I ended up using on this one is Birchwood uh, Super Blue. And again, typically I don't go out of my 18th century or use these modern items, but I just thought this is, a, this is an, an experiment, so that's what I used. Uh, and you don't want to get that modern blue of a gun. So basically, uh, I cleaned the barrel uh, after it had all been carted and filed. I applied the blue, and I left it for hmm, maybe five minutes and then I quickly rinsed it and rinsed it thoroughly and that stops the process. So essentially you're rusting the barrel. And then in order to get that gray instead of that kind of modern bluish look of modern firearms have, I carted it out with some steel wool, right, immediately after. And this only has one coat, I don't think it needs another. Uh, it's a pretty consistent tone, uh, but over time it'll get a little more modeled look, which is what I'm looking for. So finish wise. Uh, yeah, what I used uh, on the gun was uh, Jim uh, Klein's um, stains, and I demonstrated that in the last one, so I won't go into that. But there are a lot of things you could use that are natural. And I'm going to bring up Bob Miller a number of times in this, because he's an amazing artisan here in Ontario. He does scratch-built guns. Uh, he's used tobacco uh, for a stain. He's used uh, tea, uh, coffee, I believe. Uh, if you ever saw the movie The Red Violin, where the fellow's wife dies giving childbirth, he uses the blood of his dead wife to stain the famous violin. So there are lots of methods, but that's what I used. In terms of the uh, oil finish, I used uh, Jim Chambers gunstock oil. And I've only got two coats on the gun right now, but I'm going to probably put about two, at least one more, maybe two more coats. And it just gets hand rubbed in. The brass, uh, I started off by taking uh, white vinegar and salt, just iodized salt. Uh, put all the brass pieces in a bath, left them for about a half an hour or so, rinsed them off. That started the process. 
And then I mentioned after I fired it a number of times, I take the swabs from the inside of the barrel and I wipe it down and it's, it's given me the kind of patina um, that I was looking for on the brass. So it looks like a gun that's been well taken care of, but it's been used and carried for a number of years. Anyway, I thought while I'm at it, <laughs> given I'm doing two this week, I'm going to show how I maintain a musket in the way it was maintained in the 1700s with no modern products. So I'm going to bring up my good friend Bob Miller again. So for maintaining this gun, Bob gifts me every year bear fat. Um, so he, he renders down bear fat um, that looks like lard. And I use that for um, swabbing the inside of the barrel when I'm going to store it uh, as a rust preventative. I use it for patching, um, uh, lubricating the patches, uh, lubricating cushion wads. It's great stuff, but he takes it a step further and he renders it down four or five times till he gets this clear fluid that's, uh, well, you could use it for cooking oil and it has virtually no smell. And so I use that on maintaining the mechanisms inside the, inside the lock. Uh, and it, it's absolutely amazing. You won't get rust. Uh, it works as a really good lubricant for the moving parts. Uh, oh, and back to the patina, if you're going to patina um, the lock itself, you need to dissect it. You don't want to, um, you don't want to get um, acids or bluey materials or anything concoction you're using on the inside of the lock. It could severely affect the mechanism. And if I could make a recommendation, if you're going to be working on your own lock systems and guns, get yourself a, a, a spring vise. I have repaired, replaced, worked on, made so many springs from people who have mangled them with modern things like plumber pliers and vice grips and such. It's a, not that expensive a tool and it should be in your kit. So uh, for maintaining the barrel, and that's another thing, I use tow. So for cleaning the musket, for oiling the musket, um, and, and I use a worm. So there's modern ways to do it, um, but it, it helps when you totally immerse yourself into the 1800s by by using what they would have had. So just by rolling that toe up on that, using that to clean the musket, all those things I find uh, add to, to the hobby, for, for lack of a better word. And the other thing, if you think about it, black powder and, and modern petroleum products just don't go hand in hand. Um, and our ancestors had no access to petroleum products. So they used some type of, of animal fat for that maintenance. Uh, Anyway, that's some of the basic stuff I, I do for, um, for maintaining the gun. I've showed how um, I've patinaed it, and I think I've answered all those questions that I had to answer the other day. Um, well, one thing I should add, on the, on the wood itself, those three colored stains that I used, uh, the last thing I did was I carted it out with some really fine steel wool, like um, four-aught steel wool, and that sort of blended, brought out some of the... the uh, toner colors underneath and took what's I mean this is this wood turned out fancier than I thought I was going to get from Jim initially but uh, it took a fairly fairly strain place uh, plain piece of wood and actually came out pretty darn nice oh and while I'm on the build <laughs> one last thing one guy wrote in and he I think he had a Jim Kibler kit or some kit and this has got a patch box on it and you can see it's pretty secure I Maybe you can hear the actual click of it. Like, it, it is secure. A lot of people have built guns either from scratch or from kits, and they're out in a winter's trek, and they get back, and that's gone, and the contents in the patch box are gone. Um, but this fellow, he, his, his came off in his house, and his dog found it. <laughs> dog decided to use that as a chew bone. Now, now, anybody that's built one of these or done a scratch build, that little piece takes, if you're, if you're handy at tools, because it's got a fairly complicated dovetail in it there. Uh, that can take you two to three hours of work. Uh, yeah, so it's something you want, once you've got it built, you want to make sure you play with that spring, play with where it clips into the butt plate so you get that really nice, secure click. And there you go. I'm, I'm going to finish this up, put it back together. I'd like to be shooting it today because uh, I, I think the darn thing's going to shoot pretty tight. Uh, but I got one last buffalo hide to do 
And when I say last, it'll be my last buffalo hide. Man, they're a lot of work. Uh, anyway, I'm going to smoke it this afternoon and uh, get this guy back together. <laughs>